So I'm going to take you through allergic eye diseases, it's mostly ocular surface disease. And after a heavy lunch, the first five slides could put you to sleep. <laughs> but it, they're very important to understand what we're actually dealing with. Now, the immune system of the body is absolutely crucial. We'll all be dead without it. And the organisms will take over. Every day, millions of germs are interacting with us. We breathe them, we eat them, we touch them, they go into our eyes, nostrils, everywhere. And if it weren't for the immune system, we'd have a huge problem. And it's not just germs. All the foods and all the other plants and animals and the furs and skin we touch has lots of uh, molecules, proteins that can cause problems. So to fight against all of that, we have two kinds of immune systems broadly. One is what you're born with. It is there from the word go. These cells will attack anything that comes. Uh, they will attack uh, any organism or any protein of an organism comes to the body, they don't like it, it doesn't recognize it, these cells will attack them. So that's the first line of defense. And the other is the acquired immune response where the body sees a protein it has never seen before, then it takes a little while to develop an army of cells against that. And then you have that ready. The next time it comes, the response is straight away. And different people in different parts of the world may have primed immune systems for different protein because you may encounter one bacteria or virus in one part of the world and not in the other. So those people will not have it. These people will have it. That's why it's called acquired. So these responses are a double-edged sword because if they are excessive, they can also attack the patient or the person in whom they are developing. And that leads to immune-mediated diseases. So not just fight the organism and defend yourself against that, but it could start attacking your body. And then they are known as hypersensitive or hypersensitivity reactions. And there are four types of these reactions. And they're all relevant to allergic eye disease. The type one is called the immediate hypersensitivity. So you contact the organism, immediately you start watery eye, red eye, sneezing, coughing. That's hypersensitivity. The word there is histamine. And therefore, we all hear about antihistamines for allergic eye disease because the chemical that is released is histamine and immunoglobulin E. They are re released by these cells, and they cause immediate vasodilation and exudation of uh, substances from the blood vessels into the tissue, so you get swelling and redness, etc. So these are uh, affect not just the eyes, but can affect uh, the, the, the mouth, the nose, and other parts of the body. The type two are less common, and these are the cytotoxic hypersensitivity reactions. These are cells that are destroying tissue, and they, like we see, uh, as in hemolytic anemia, anemia and blood transfusion. So when the reaction occurs, they go and destroy cells. The type 3 are more common, and these are immune complexes. So what happens when an antigen meets an antibody, they join together, they form an immune complex. It either precipitates, or if it is not in optimal concentration, it floats about as a soluble product. These soluble products get deposited on membranes, like blood vessel membranes or in the kidney membranes, and then they attract inflammatory cells. They're very, very potent chemoattractants, and you get inflammation. And in the eye, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid, Steven Johnson syndrome are the two common conditions we see, relatively speaking, that, that these reactions are operating. And the final one is the type four, which is related to cells, not to antibodies, the first three have antibodies. The fourth one is cell-mediated. And these cells, rather than the antibodies, attack tissue. And corneal graft rejection, for example, is one of the common examples uh, that we, we see in ophthalmology. Uh, but the picture gets even more confusing because it may start as one, trigger the other, and eventually it's a combination of all of them. So it's very difficult to select out one, except in the early stage of the disease, but if it's chronic, then you have both the antibody-mediated and the cell-mediated immune responses going on. Now, this whole orchestra has numerous players, and these are in the form of cells, 
and you can see there are many, many different sites. You name a cell, it's most likely to be involved over there. They call the T lymphocytes, you can be helper cytotoxics, the B lymphocytes, NK cells, mast cells, basophils, eosinophils, all these cells, they give names to cells, they all participate in these immune responses and they release chemicals when they are activated. And these chemicals are given a whole lot of names and histamine like is one of them, immunoglobulin E is another, interferon, immunoglobulin G, and they then combine to cause these reactions. Now, why is all this information necessary? It gives you some idea. Even if you retain 1% of this, you get there's something going on in the background. So when you have to treat, you have to treat that something. Rather than what you see, you're actually treating that phenomenon at the back that's going on. So what is that phenomenon? To understand that, there are three terms, and this is probably the last of the five slides. The ATOP, an atopic individual is one who has uh, the, the ability to response and immuno, uh, make an immunoglobulin E response. That is very important in the immediate hypersensitivity. So as you can see there, 5 to 20 percent of the population is atopic, which means they have the ability to mount a more than required IgE response. So then when, you is ex when it is excessive, you get a problem. And what is allergy? Allergy is sensitivity to the environmental antigen. So if I eat chilies, I get a very severe reaction. Somebody can eat a ton of chilies, get no reaction. So I've got an allergy to a product. And we all have allergies to different products. But if you are atopic, that's even worse because your ability to mount the Ig response is more even for a small amount of antigen compared to the other person. And the allergen is the substance to which you get allergy. So these are the terms we need to know. An atopic individual, allergy, the response to an allergen. Allergen is usually a protein but can be any, any product. So on the basis of this background information, you can wake up now, we have uh, these different types of allergic conjunctivitis of the eye. They all call this AAC, ACC, PAC. In simple terms, you get acute allergic conjunctivitis, seasonal allergic conjunctivitis, perineal, which is all the year round, and they're all th the first three are more or less the same thing, only the timing is different. Then you have vernal, atopic, remember the word atopy, and then giant papillary conjunctivitis. So acute allergic conjunctivitis occurs immediately. It's a one-off to a certain antigen or allergen in the environment. It can occur at any age, but usually common in children because as you grow older, your body sense adapts to that, that antigen and you become less sensitive. And it can affect people who have atopy and those who have so they, they, they need not necessarily have an ability to make an exaggerated IgE response. It can affect both types of individuals. And the symptoms are intense itching, swelling of the lids, redness, and it's usually self-limiting. The allergy, allergen gets washed out or is destroyed by the body and everything goes back to normal. It does not leave any lasting effect and therefore usually does not require any treatment. But if you treat it with cold water or some antihistamines for a day or two, it will settle. And that's an example of the reaction. You see the redness of the lids and the swelling of the conjunctiva and the redness of the conjunctiva as well. And here's another example of the same thing. Now, seasonal allergic conjunctivitis is exactly the same thing, but happening only in a particular season. And that is because in that season, the allergen is most abundant. And what we find is that, you know, we say hay fever, and that's during the, the, the spring or summer, and we see in the UK, a fairly large one quarter of the population almost is affected, and it's usually due to this rye pollen and the Timothy grass pollen, which causes it, but it's often due to tree pollens as well. Uh, it is a mild condition, but a lot of people take time off sick because of that, and the burden on the labor market is huge and on, of course, the, of course, the employers who are paying for those people for their sick leave. Uh, the diagnosis by, by history, uh, you can look at the patient, the clinical signs uh, are mild, but that redness, itching symptom together will tell you. And they will tell you it ha occurs every summer, it occurs every spring, it only lasts for two or three months and then I'm okay. And like I said, hay fever is a common example of that. And these are the symptoms, the same as the previous symptoms. 
but blurring of vision can occur. And you have to remember this, and it will come through in other talks as well. Uh, one of the most important component of sight, proper focusing of light, is your tear film. And you'll see outside, therefore, everybody is selling tear film products because when the tear film is disrupted, you're focusing, the polish is gone. And when that polish is gone, focusing is, and that's why they can complain of blurring of vision because they have to blink frequently to replenish the tear film. And, and, and that's when putting some teardrops might be useful. And when you may, you may argue, well, they get a watery eye, and then why do you want to put more tears in the eye? But the, this, the understanding is that the watery eye is not forming a film, it is running water, but to stabilize it on the cornea and give the cornea polish, you still need to put teardrops in the presence of a watery eye. And these are the symptoms, exactly like I said for the previous, you know, but one important thing which as optometrists, as nurses and doctors we don't do is turn the lid around. And it's not always easy, but if the patient has eyelashes, you hold the eyelash, you put a paper clip at the back of the tassel plate and you can flip it. Uh, sometimes you can do it without a paper clip, but if they don't have eyelashes, then don't bother because you can't do it unless you hold with the forceps and that you won't do in the clinic. But make it a habit to try and turn the lid around. You discover so many things, including foreign bodies and bits of grass or something underneath the lids. So you can see normal tassel plate of the flip lid is pinkish, but it can be quite red and hyperemic in people with seasonal or acute allergic conjunctivitis. There is no corneal involvement. No corneal involvement in acute allergic, no corneal involvement in seasonal allergic, um, and there is no corneal involvement in the perineal allergic conjunctivitis either. Very important distinction from the other two or three to come. So the perineal is this exactly the same again, but is all the year round because the antigen is present all the year round. So you take them out from one country to another and they're really good. They come back and usually it happens, people who go out on holiday are fine, they come back to UK, we're full of allergens of all kinds, they're in your carpet, in your bed, in your pillow covers, and that allergen is what causes these problems. The commonest one in the UK is this dust mite. And this mite is uh, it's excrement and it's protein in the thing, it sheds and when it dies, it's, it crumbles and all the protein. And it's like, seems quite yucky, but we are living with it our lives day in and day out all the time. And that's what is causing this problem uh, which lasts all the year round. And it, this is the commonest bug that causes this in the United Kingdom. And again, you look under the eyelids and you can see uh, redness, but that's about it, different grades of redness. And like I said, the important distinction, all three of these do not affect the cornea, and that is very important. So any visual blurring is temporary and it recovers fully, which is different from the fourth variety, which is vernal keratoconjunctivitis. And this has a wide variation in the European population between one and 10 to 10, uh, one to 10 in 10, thousand population in Africa, it is much more, and the age is variable, usually childhood. And it can be a blinding condition because it does affect the cornea. And the corneal blindness is, is the reason why people don't see. And when there is excessive amount of this going on for a long time, other infections supervene because the condition with all the proteinaceous fluid bacteria, viruses, and parasites can, can flourish in the eye, and that makes the condition worse. So the pathogenesis is quite complex. As we saw, it is usually a type four uh, reaction. There's a family history of atopy, or the patient may have it, and uh, himself, and it's a combination of the type one and the type four. Like I said, eventually it's all type, predominantly type four, hypersensitivity with the cells playing a major role, but then the antibodies also kick in, the eosinophils, IgE, basophils, and mast cells, and it's a mixed uh, kind of a reaction to all these elements of the immune system. And it is assumed that the hormones may also play a role because it becomes much less after puberty. So you have to maintain the patient, make sure the cornea is preserved. Once they cross puberty, chances are it will settle. So you have to assure the mothers that they can keep the treatment going 
but he will grow out of the condition. They don't always do that, but they often do. And what you will see is this. When you turn the lid around, you will see these papillae. The problem with these papillae is that once they form, they don't go away in a hurry. So even in an eye which is quiet and asymptomatic, you will see them. In an eye which is actively inflamed, you will see large papillae, much redder, a lot of mucoid discharge. So we see that if the patient is asymptomatic, we don't treat it. But if you see that, we do treat it. And the point is that the papillae do not go away. Therefore, whenever you see a papilla, you don't have to treat it. It's only if the patient is symptomatic. And eventually, there's a lot of scarring, and this can cause further problems if the lids are scarred and they start to turn around, or the lid is scarred to the bulbar conjunctiva, then you have difficulty in opening the lids and the problems that come from that. And here's another example of this, and you can see the scarring that has occurred between the papillae, but the papillae are still there. These papillae are actually a core of blood vessels and surrounded by uh, uh, scar tissue, and it squeezes the blood vessels and the soft tissue out, and they become like lumpy. They can be distributed along the limbus, this, then they're called tarantas dots. You can have corneal vascularization, as you will see over here in these patients, and that causes problems of its own and perpetuates the inflammatory response, which goes on and on. And then it affects the cornea in, in many different ways. Vascularization is one, but it causes this tiny little dot. You put fluorescein, they'll all light up as green dots, so you get fine, diffuse uh, punctate keratitis, also called microerosions. You get larger, coarser lesions called macroerosions. You can get a plaque on the cornea. Uh, where's that? Uh, yeah, so there you can see there'll be plaques on the cornea. This is a large white plaque right in the center of the cornea. And these are very difficult to treat and sometimes have to be surgically removed. And people with allergic eye disease, not just vernal keratoconjunctivitis, which is more common, they tend to rub their eyes because they're itchy. And rubbing eyes is the only known association very strongly linked to keratoconus where the eye becomes conical in shape, as you see over here. So corneal involvement in many different ways happens. And this is the same patient with keratoconus, with fluorescein. You can see that's the apex of the cone. The surface is staining. It's rough. The cells are falling off. New cells are coming. So various ways in which the cornea gets involved and affects sight. Now, atopic keratoconjunctivitis, which is the, the, the next in line, the next category, it is the similar sort of thing occurring in patients who have a strong atopy. So they have history of eczema, history of asthma, and eye problems. So when you have these, they may have dermatitis due to the eczema as well. And when you see these together, you know this is atopic keratoconjunctivitis. There, the papillary reaction is not so prominent, but it can be. And, and only the history will tell them apart. And sometimes you can do IgE testing in these patients. But the features that you see are slightly different to vernal in that the lids are more involved, because that's the skin being involved, than the conjunctival surface alone that we see more often with the vernal keratoconjunctivitis. So eczema of the facial and the eyelid skin, uh, the rest of the features are like VKC in the eye, and it also involves the cornea, and therefore is sight-threatening. Again, the pathogenesis is very complex, like we saw with vernal keratoconjunctivitis. But this is also associated with keratoconus, with cataract, because the lens of the eye develops from the ectoderm, which is the same layer from which the skin develops. So the lens of the eye is connected to the skin. If there's skin problem, then the lens also will show a problem, and you can get cataract and also retinal detachment and vitreous uh, liquefaction and vitreous detachment. So these are some of these associations which can be uh, more complex with atopic but not with vernal. <coughs> Excuse me. And this again affects a fairly large one fifth of the population uh, can have, and this atopic keratoconjunctivitis occurs in 20 to 40 percent of these patients and, uh, and, and patients with, with the skin disease. Uh, there are various other incidences that are written over there. Uh, you can see with concomitant eczema or with asthma, it's more in men than in women. And the peak age is 30 to 50 years. So uh, 
it can it can spread over a wide range and, and most of your working life is then affected with this condition at the big impact on your ability to earn a living. So if you look at the, the, the symptoms, so let's go back, yeah. So they will, they will, uh, the VKC will not have a, a seasonal variation and the the symptoms, they flare up each time the skin or the asthma flares up, they flare up. So sometimes they come to us and we treat them with cyclosporine and the skin gets better. Sometimes they have eye problem, they go to the dermatologist who treats the skin and the eye gets better. So whatever the treatment you give generally affects them, uh, um, the whole body, which is good because anybody can treat that. So what are the signs uh, of these you see in the... It's not showing up in the screen. Only when I go back, it shows up. See, there's nothing there. Nothing there. Nothing there. Yeah, okay. So the, the point here is you can see this excoriation, and you see these uh, little ulcers on the lid margins, which are very common with atopic eye disease, and not so much with... Uh, the um, vernal. Now here there was a picture which is not showing and then let's see if I go back. So the pictures are not showing through. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's why I said, you know, we should have used my own laptop. Anyway, uh, some, I mean, they're not, not that important, but I think we'll just go back straight to um, this uh, final condition called giant papillary conjunctivitis. It is fitted in with these conditions, but it is really not truly an allergic reaction. It is neither due to allergy nor due to atopy. Uh, it usually occurs due to chronic inflammation like a loose suture causing repetitive trauma or rubbing can cause these papillae to form. And they are quite large papillae, and they are found uh, in, the, in the skin, and they're given different names according to the size of the papillae, the giant micro papillae. Uh, but they are, uh, the inflammation is minimal, and they do not affect the cornea. So other than vernal and atopic, the other allergic conditions do not affect the cornea and therefore do not cause blindness, do not affect vision, whereas uh, those two do. And that's why it's important to distinguish between those two. And if you're in the primary care sector, you know you can treat everything except VKC and AKC, which you need to refer if there is a cornea involvement. Otherwise, even that can be treated in the, in the community. So these are examples of the giant papillary conjunctivitis, as you see over here, and sometimes it can be very mild. And uh, contact lenses, chronic contact lens wear can cause giant papillary conjunctivitis because constant rubbing uh, under the lids and orbital prosthesis and implants can cause it. So these are some other examples of that condition. Uh, so how do we treat them? Uh, if you know the allergen, you avoid it. If you don't know it, and often you don't know it, then you treat the acute symptoms. So there are a whole host of antihistamine drops available. Some people, if they're having systemic symptoms or even their nose is running, then you can give them tablets of antihistamines, but you warn them that they cause drowsiness and that can affect their ability to, to work and especially to drive. But antihistamines, usually topical, are good enough. Uh, and sometimes, like I said, systemic with the other symptoms, when the other symptoms are present. Uh, you have mast cells stabilized. Now, mast cells are the ones that degranulate to release histamine. So if you stabilize the mast cells, then you will prevent them from releasing the histamine. But once it's released, then antihistamines will do the job, but mast cell stabilizers won't. So you give both. And often there's a combination of the two, and those are the various uh, names. Some of them are the trade names, 
where the, like olopatidine is a combination of a mast cell stabilizer and an antihistamine, so it has a dual effect. But sodium chromoglycate, uh, again, is a mast cell stabilizer, but not an antihistamine. So if the patient comes in active disease, you treat with an antihistamine, but if you know it's seasonal, then during the season, they can start the mast cell stabilizer and it'll stop the disease from happening. Uh, and then, of course, there are non-inflammatory, non, sorry, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs that are help, that help, and then, of course, there are the steroids. There are many, many different kinds of steroids. You start with the least concentration or the, the ones with the least potential for side effects, and we know the two main side effects, in fact, there are three main side effects of steroids uh, that are given topically. One of them is cataract over long-term use. And the thing about cataract which people don't understand is you may use FML, which is a weaker steroid, or you may use betamethasone, dexamethasone, at the other end of the spectrum. It is a dose-related effect. So it will take longer with one, like a quicker with the other, it's not that one will not cause and the other will not cause. But eventually, when the cumulative dose reaches a certain level, then you'll like to get and mostly posterior subcapsular cataract. The other is glaucoma. So about 10 to 15 percent of the population responds to steroids with, with raising their pressure. It is reversible in the initial stages. So if ever you start anybody on steroids, no matter how weak the steroid is, they must have constant pressure checks, otherwise you might uh, end up, and I have seen this happen, patients with extremely deep cups lost all their field of vision, and a lot of their vision as well, just because they were treating the surface condition with steroids. And the third less known one, but it happens, is reactivation of herpetic eye disease. And many of these atopic individuals have herpetic corneal problems, uh, and they will reactivate if you're there on steroids, and, and then you have problems, so one has to watch out for those as well. There are steroid-sparing immunosuppressive agents, uh, and we have a few of them in the market. Uh, Icurvis is a cyclosporin preparation. In, the, in America, there's lifetigrass, and there is uh, protopic. Protopic is probably going to come as an eye preparation in the UK, not yet there but we have a skin cream and we tend to use this 0.3%, sorry, the 0.03% off-label to treat uh, atopic eye disease, and particularly when the skin is involved and it works like magic, and I'll show you a picture. And then you have artificial tears, like I said earlier, when they have thick ropey discharge with AKC and VKC, then the mucolytic agents like the uh, eye lube helps to dissolve the mucus, and if they're filamentary keratitis, helps to dissolve the mucus. And then sometimes, if they're very large papillae, they have to be surgically excised. If there's a plaque, it, in the early stages, it can disappear with the treatment, but uh, often you have to go in and excise the plaque, and you may cover it with the amniotic membrane to allow that area to heal. So AAC, SAC, and PAC, the allergic seasonal and acute and the perineal, just drops, usually self-limiting, if there is concomitant infection, give an antibiotic, otherwise not. VKC, uh, you need most of them, including steroid treatment. And, and in, in the, the long term, if you want to spare steroids, then you switch. So you induce remission with steroids, and then you switch to cyclosporin or protopic. And, and uh, in the atopic patients where the risk of cataract and cornea problems is higher, you may have to resort to surgery for those conditions as well. Uh, in giant papillary conjunctivitis, the, the most common re reason to remove a large papilla is because it, it grabs the contact lens and doesn't let the contact lens move on the eye, and then you have to take out one or two of them to allow the area to become smooth uh, before they can tolerate a contact lens. Now, this patient, if you look at this patient here, you can see um, how bad the lids are, how excoriated they are, and it's very sharp pain they get when that comes in contact with water. And look at this crusting. And this patient was treated with protopic cream, and it's as though you've just wiped the board clean. You can see how smooth and clean the lids have become with this uh, tacrolimus skin ointment applied to the lid margin. So it's an off-label use of the drug, but it's extremely effective. And just to finish off with this summary slide, 
So those are the six the C's at the end, the conjunctive ITDs that we've listed. The age group is slightly different. Uh, the predisposing factor is slightly different. As you can see in GPC, is the contact lens variable, but no history of atopy or allergy to anything. In the UK, uh, uh, VKC and AKC is comparatively rare, and you're comparing this to Africa and India, for example, but uh, overall it is quite debilitating to the patients who suffer from it. The corneal involvement is the key, and I've stressed that already two or three times. Only these two conditions affect the cornea, hence they have to be monitored very carefully. Uh, the morbidity corresponds to the corneal involvement, and the need for steroid also is f related to that, but the top three conditions which do not affect the cornea and are self-limiting, one treats them with other drugs, not steroids, whereas these two need steroids, and this one hardly needs any treatment. Thank you.